So we're running a little bit behind now. We were going to have a Q&A start at 7 o'clock. I believe we're about 20 minutes behind, so I'm going to make this conclusion very brief. Before we move to questions, um, frankly, I want to thank everyone uh, who's come from around the world to be here, along with the tech team, the speakers, everyone listening on the webcast, and everyone obviously generally who has the courage to go out and promote what are very difficult ideas on a certain level, not to mention the cultural strife that you get immediately from this sort of value system disorder that keeps persisting in the world. Uh, we've tried our best in this presentation to present a train of thought. This was the design of this particular program, and we hope that you walk out of this event with a decent arsenal of understanding of how this works, the components of it, and how to relay it to others uh, as efficiently as you can. And of course, as Eva said, there's a lot of material that's being produced right now. A roughly 200-page guide text is being produced called the Zeitgeist Movement Defined, which should be out hopefully in a couple months, long overdue. Uh, that will be freely available, and it should serve as the Bible of sorts for what this movement's about. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, the zeitgeist moves on in one direction or another, and we can choose to orient it or not. We are all in the zeitgeist movement one way or another. The question is, how aware and responsible are you when it comes to the inevitable unfolding of the change you are invariably a part of? Now, it's usually at this point in a program of such, in the general kind of activism, sustainability movements, that someone comes out puts up a screen and tells you where to donate all your money. <laughs> we don't work that way. The Zeitgeist Movement has no offices, it has no employees, it takes no donations, and our events are strategically designed, usually badly, to break even, which they usually don't. <laughs> this movement is about personal effort. You don't give to the Zeitgeist Movement, you become a part of it by your actions. You learn, you communicate, you become part of the process of social transformation, and as tedious as it may seem, there is a tipping point that can occur. Before the age of the internet, it's hard to fathom how mass social, social revolutions ever happened at all. Imagine without a telephone, but yet we go back in history, these things did occur. And we have much, a vast amount of tools now that was never possible before, which makes this possibility that much more possible. And every time you engage people, uh, you need to remember that all of your actions, regardless if it's relating to the Zeitgeist Movement specific content or not, is going to have an effect. What I mean by that is every time you engage people in an unselfish way, you plant the seed for them to be unselfish as well. Every time you give to somebody instead of exploiting them, you plant the seed for them to give to other people and to to not look at exploitation and personal gain, personal gain as a virtue, as, as we have, unfortunately, in the world today. So behavior is viral, and values are viral. Apart from that, it's also important to realize that this train of thought is extremely self-evident. And the goal is not to convince anyone of these understandings, but to set up the condition for them to realize it for themselves. That is probably the most profound thing that I've ever realized, you don't impose, you set it up, and if anything is really true, then we all should have the capacity to realize it on our own without feeling imposition. So this concludes the presentation. I think all the speakers and everyone that's coming, we're gonna have a Q&A right now, but thank you all, and thank you all on the webcast. Can you hear me? Okay. First question. How long would you imagine to set up a resource-based economy? Go ahead. Mic off. Mic. Test, test, test. How long will it take to get the microphone to work? <laughs> <laughs> hello? Hello? There we go. All right. Why is that a loaded question? Uh, of course, we're talking about changing the planet, so to throw a time scale on it is, is erroneous, I think, on its face, but I look at it this way. I don't expect to see this happen in my lifetime, and I'm doing that to myself on purpose, <laughs> all right? Think about it. If you're doing this for the selfish reason of I want it for me, why are you doing it? I'm doing it probably knowing that I'm not going to see it happen in my lifetime, and I'm doing it anyway. Uh, 
I would just add to that that there is a, a value shift that can happen in more of a step-by-step -step sense. Obviously, the definition of a resource-based economy, and as what Eva said earlier, that we're always in transition. So planting the seeds of these values, which we're seeing anyway, almost forced by the environment, such as this kind of greenwash thing we see in corporate America right now, at least it's a positive notion, even though they don't really understand what they're up against and the public doesn't understand that you really can't have a green corporation because it goes against the very fundamental laws of the market economy. So there is a step-by-step -step concept that people should keep in mind, and there really is no final end. We can achieve a certain percentage of this in a certain abstract sense. Global unity, obviously, in its final state of optimization when the world is working together in a systems approach would be by, would, excuse me, be the final definition of it, though. I was only going to add one thing very quickly, which is that um, uh, imagine you're in the 1980s. Well, briefly, it's awful. Um, <laughs> uh, anybody here think that you would have had Occupy in the 80s? Or uh, uh, things like Kickstarter and, and all the rest of it in the 1980s? Uh, or all of the sort of tiny little, you know, e e eco-farming thing, the, the spread of new technologies, things like 3D printing. I spent a lot of time on aeroplanes, and Lufthansa's main article in their January issue was 2013, the, the year of the 3D printer. This is actually a night and day difference for, uh, from prior ages. It doesn't feel that way because you got used to it really quickly. So um, we're already on our way there, um, and we... we have a trouble seeing that, I think, sometimes. So let's not finish, but we, we should applaud already some of the, the moves that have been made that are in line with a more sustainable sort of system. I like to remind people, because this is really a transition question, uh, that the current capitalist market system didn't start at like 2 o'clock on a Tuesday. So we need to start asking ourselves, well, what, you know, what is when... Well, I should say, when people ask me, what does a transition look like? My response is, well, look around. What does it look like to you? You're in it. This is it. Uh, people talking about these ideas is part of the transition. And I like what in Eva's presentation when she talked about how even 40% of the way there, even though it may not have every single thing in place, we need to recognize the distance that we've come and what we've come from and what we're working towards. So it is a work in progress just add something very quick to quantify things a little bit. There's an interesting social science uh, study that came out, I, I believe I saw it first on zeitnews.org, uh, that found that when a particular idea was adopted by about 10% of the population, that was often the, um, pardon me? Was, was often the threshold or the tipping point for it to become adopted by the majority or by a large group of people. So perhaps that's the critical mass that we're talking about that we have to, that we have to reach and get to uh, embrace the ideas that we're advocating. Next question, I guess. Okay, next question. In an era with no police, state, how do we fight crimes of passion such as rape, domestic abuse, etc.? First of all, we should point out that 95 to 99 percent of most crime exists um, as a direct result of the pressures induced by the monetary system, um, and probably the rest could say to would could be said to indirectly be related. Um, remember, there's always a behavioral chain of causality that needs to be understood. Uh, just because we can't understand um, the source of a particular behavioral abnormality doesn't mean that it's just ingrained in, in, in the human species or anything like that. Um, also, we're not claiming that we can get rid of 100% of all crime or all, you know, every form of behavioral distortion. The point is to build an environment that brings out the best of all human people and to reduce the, the negatives that our current system produces. I would, uh, I would add to that that um, in an environment that is as positive, at least intuitively positive, as what we're talking about, any aberrant ha behavior after that point in almost every respect would be a mental disorder, a medical issue. There is something going on up here likely that has triggered a, a misbehavior, and that is... That's a medical thing that we can help people and learn from and try to figure out the human condition even better. I mean, we do a good job of sabotaging our own human condition as it is in this system. So, you know, to, to get out of this system and 
then be able to look at ba bad behavior in a different under a different uh, set of circumstances will do nothing more than improve the awareness of ourselves. So for me, questions like that are, it's more of a medical thing. It would be helped. People would be psychologically and medically helped, but not like medically, here's this pill, but medically in a more scientific, traditional sense. Just to, to kind of shatter the simplicity and absolutism of the question, even though it's been stated in a poetic sense, in the future system, you don't want, there's no necessity for prisons and police. There's something I've termed the humanity factor, and that's this causal element. There's a, there's a chaos to human development, and to say you can weed out, either biologically or culturally, every type of offensive behavior is very difficult. It doesn't mean you can't reduce it to a fraction of a percent based on where we are now. So in James Gilligan, who's a tremendous thinker in violence, he makes the statement very clear. It's a public health, health issue if you have somebody who's so aberrated to remove them from society. It doesn't mean you're going to abuse them and punish them like we do in the structure of this arcane prison system we have today. But to remove someone, so to have an official authority, a public health official, who if needs to use restraint on somebody who's completely out of control with a mental disorder harming people, you remove them and you take care of them and figure out what happened. That isn't the same as prisons and police, but there's a function there that with like any immune system, things can go wrong. Our system isn't, you, isn't perfect, so your body can develop problems, the immune system comes in. That's why the joke, the zeitgeist movement, the social immune system of the world, uh, it relates to a different level to say that we're actually trying to get rid of all these other aberrancies to reduce all these problems because of this cancerous system in general. So I hope that makes sense. It's an absolutism that's, uh, that's really a fallacy, as Matt pointed out in his lecture. And we shouldn't forget that um, some of these practices are already in place. If you go to Norway, uh, you'll see that some prisons are actually rehabilitation centers where people work together, they kind of figure out what happened in their life, and they learn new skills and they get integrated in the community. So instead of, you know, in most prisons, you get somebody who's virtually honest or maybe they commit a very demeanor, like not, not much of a big deal, crime, then he gets in and becomes a criminal, right? A real criminal, because he has to deal with that kind of pressure in the prison. In some countries more evolved, like Norway, this doesn't happen. So it's not like we're talking about something completely alien to what we're already experiencing. And also public officials should be uh, proportional to uh, the requirements for them. So it, it, the, the question, how would you deal with you know, the rapist or in the future if you don't have a police? well, you're going to have the proportional number of public officials to the crimes that you have. So you're never going to be out of public officials to take care of that situation because it's an evolving process. Okay. Who and or what is the greatest challenge to be overcome for this reality to be achieved? I just throw out some good ones, don't you? <laughs> I think definitely the human factor. You want to please share? Okay. Uh, so I see Stanton, the whole table come flying. It'd be great. Um, <laughs> so the question was, what is the greatest obstacle to overcome? Uh, well, to answer that on a social level would be uh, our the practices that are deteriorating our well-being, and that's a vague answer because it covers a lot of ground from. Uh, uh, the environmental aspects to the social stresses, the social stressors, the biosocial stressors. You have the uh, pollution inputs, the uh, stress on your physiology. You also have the um, mental input, the stress on your your mental state, say through uh, debt or from you know working under in a structure where it's very uh, basically like a private little dictatorship when you go to work and you punch in your time card, All, and so on a larger scale overcoming those pressures, but th that's only through identifying what the root cause is. If you think you're going to run out and fight every cause in the world, well, you'll never stop doing that while they all continue to be perpetuated. And um, uh, so identifying the root cause and then uh, overcoming those on a social scale, but then on a personal level, your greatest obstacle is you in a way because it depends on how you s see this information. If the person who asked that question actually identifies with, their with this uh, train of thought that we've put forth today, then 
you're on your way to actually changing and updating your social value within the landscape around you. Uh, if everything we presented today you, is nonsense, then I don't know what to tell that person. It's just the greatest challenge is, you know, I guess the pressure has not become high enough yet. It hasn't become bad enough yet uh, to, to see the disparity between what we think works now and the outcomes that we're, we're all uh, uh, living in. Yeah, excellent points. And just to stem off of that, it's it's all about realizing your own power. You know, realizing. I mean, there's so many intelligent people in this audience right now. I'm continually impressed. I have a lot of chapter interaction with with the movement here in Los Angeles, and there's so many intelligent people that I come across that, quite frankly, probably know more than I do about a lot of these subjects. And it's just about stepping into your own power and stepping into your own. You know, doing something with that intelligence and, and channeling it and realizing, yeah, you can do some, you can do public activism. I was never an activist before any of this stuff, but it's just, and I'm not comfortable, totally comfortable doing this stuff yet, uh, but it's, it needs to happen. So it's, it's a really a lot about, you know, what Jason said, values, what you value, what kind of, what you do with your time and committing to that and realizing that this is a long a long process and just enjoy just enjoy creating social change i can't imagine you know anything more fun than than doing that so and uh i'll just i'll touch on what what jason said a bit i think sometimes a lot of people even who do uh empathize with this direction get discouraged because they witness a lot of apathy from other people so i mean some people get very offended and argumentative and things like that but I almost feel like it's worse if you just get no reaction at all like oh sounds cool whatever it's like this is kind of a big deal um, but a lot of times I feel like most of it comes from the fact that people don't know a lot of people don't know there's a solution a lot of people don't know even what the root causes of the problems are so that's how you run into that that kind of apathy and what you see around you people are more preoccupied doing other things I mean I'm probably one of them I, obviously I wasn't doing this my whole life it wasn't until I really knew that there was a direction to work towards um, so that you know it's kind of the same thing with that that obstacle being just getting the information out there so that people who become aware that there's somewhere to go from here start to move in that direction. Is that it? Okay. <laughs> okay. How do we practically smart ourselves up after being so effectively dumbed down? <laughs> First of all, I want to congratulate you on the funniest question so far. Um, that sort of ties in a little bit with what I was saying. Um, uh, who here would say that most of their education these days comes from direct contact with the internet? Right? We get all our news from there. We learn about things like the Khan Academy from there and all the rest of it. We read our books, which are delivered by the internet. Uh, you're, you're receiving news sources that can't go through a sensor just through the, st like the structure of the way that this is set up. I do think that most of the education, and by the way, you know more than like Galileo did, right? You're, you're geniuses compared to Galileo, bear that in mind. Um, uh, this kind of stuff is sort of, I think education is sort of built in. Now, of course, there are a lot of people who can just use the internet for cat videos. Um, but I think that that's changing. I do think that overall, as things are sort of shared more and that the sort of social engine pushes information outwards by people who deliberately want it to be uh, shared, and as that becomes more of a social effort rather than just, hey, look at this cat video, uh, then I think this sort of gradually tips the balance, almost like the tipping point you were talking about. Um, so I would say it is definitely going to be systemic education, I'll put it that way, um, rather than just going to school. Even schools are changing now as well. I do think it's going to be the, the general interaction between the availability of information and the way that the interaction actually sends that information on as well. And especially our children right now. Uh, are, I mean, my daughter has already learned way more than I did and has come into contact with operating systems and concepts about the earth and all the rest of it. Not through me being anywhere near a good parent, but just the fact that there is all this interactivity and availability of information and all the rest of it. So I, I don't know if that helps. <laughs> we are legion indeed. How can we break through or even compete or be heard in a world where secret societies, the Freemasonry elites, already have an iron grip, total control of every facet of our lives? <laughs> <laughs> How can we penetrate their iron grip? There's no, um, it's unique because uh, in a lot of circles since my first film came out, 
there was this new uh, kind of thing that was never stated in the film, but was pres presumed to be in the film, and that was this idea that there's a small group of really cool people that live under some mountain somewhere that control everything. <laughs> and, you know, as convenient as that is to think about, and that's one of the criticisms I think I agree with, the sort of anti-conspiracy theory cult out there that hates anything because they, they reduce it all to these simplistic terms. Excuse me, some people that live in a conspiratorial mo mindset can reduce things to a highly, highly isolated and simplistic form of reasoning. And it is worthy of great criticism. I agree with that criticism. And that's where this is kind of born out of. It's no question that there have been secret societies. In fact, Scientology is by complete definition a secret society along with many other very prominent modern facilities, they operate the exact same way than these societies have operated. And there's no mystery to them. That's what I find so amusing. All they are are small groups of really immature people that hoard knowledge, and they use immense power that they establish in one way or another for different purposes. And this goes back to the gang mentality, this tribalism that is really no different than a state, really no different than a corporation, except they think they're really, really cool because they have all this information and they've had it for a really long time. And that's really all they are, a bunch of immature kids. And the thing is, they're not actually in control of anything. What's in control is a mindset that they subscribe to, that everyone thinks is equally as cool. So the entire corporate facade of, of hoarding information, creating things through di extreme restriction, is a secret society in its same mindset. There's no prominent uh, way to describe uh, this in a way that's relevant to the effect that I acknowledge the existence of these things, because even if they are in existence and in operation, it doesn't matter, because they have no real power than the elusive power we give to them in this sort of question that was just asked. So if you're actually, uh, in other words, if you're an intelligent society looking at the train of thought, how can anyone stop you if you come together in mass? So it doesn't matter who these people are or who they were or where they came from. You just move forward with the train of thought. Okay. A question that has come up more than once during our meetings in Mexico is how would you recommend to approach with this information to people that live day to day, working more than eight hours a week in a factory? What would be the simplest way to talk to those people that unfortunately are not that well educated? Well, you have to start small. You obviously don't start at, we want to evolve into a resource-based economy. You have to really start simple with people and, and acknowledge how much time they actually have and, and where they're coming from, of course, as far as what their problems are. And, and you know, this, w we've got materials that pitch different angles to that. And, and um, as far as talking to people about that are day-to-day -day struggle, that's kind of the question, right? A day-to-day -day struggle. Um, I mean, just speak to their values and, and just get them to realize that where the root causes are of a lot of their problems are, if they can even manage a few minutes to, to, to give you, to care about that stuff, because you're talking about people that are struggling and, and going through a lot of problems still. So. Just uh, get them to realize where these where their problems are actually coming from at the very most simple level, and I think that's a great place to start. And if they can manage to actually, you know, get more interested and have more interest and actually have time to contribute and and do, you know, just to at least support it is actually the the most simple, uh, greatest thing I can imagine. I mean, just support the direction, support a, a better world for world for all people, support getting to the root of the problems, support advocating um, solutions that can evolve society in general, and I think that's a great place to start. So. Also, I think it's important that with people that are struggling so hard on a daily basis that don't even have the time to give to research all of this, is to connect with them just on a real human level. And, you know, they're, um, Without money, we'd all be rich, is a saying, you know? And people that are at that level may be under this dream that they can make it too, like we all are, that if they just work hard enough, if they can just, you know, be lucky enough to, to be like Michael Jordan or someone else, you know, and have a lot of money. But we know that 
not everyone can be like that. So I think the most important thing is to identify with them on a human level as we're all struggling, none of us are wealthy, and um, to let them know they're not alone in that and that um, at least something else exists. And in whatever language you can explain that, that there is another alternative, we're working towards it on their behalf, whatever they end up doing or not, it doesn't matter, but just so that they know that. I think that's really important. I think creating community wherever you can with people who are like-minded, seeking answers to solutions is really key uh, to let them know, yeah, that they are not alone and and to educate and share resources together and in the best way that you can. I think it is psychologically um, a, a stress, I guess the psychological stress can be alleviated through the understanding of your relationship to the system and maybe that will lift some of the feelings of, oh, I'm in my position because I'm not good enough or I'm not, I'm in my position because I'm not educated and to rec you know, have them recognize that um, that that's that's not what's really yeah it's not you it's the system and help facilitate just whatever resourcefulness you can can pull together for the community and, and as the more techie of the group um, I would say something that could be done uh, this would all be situationally specific so I'm going to be very broad here would be to help set up it's like a series of did you know questions did you know about aquaponics do you know what that is you know we could set that up in your community and grow some food on the side maybe four or five of you could get together and we could set up a little community garden farm or something like that using an aquaponics system and maybe everybody pool some resources in the financial sense since that's what we're stuck with and set up something like that and you need to do that for one or two months and you do another one and then you do another one and you start eroding their need to you start helping re relieve that grocery budget a little bit by growing some lettuces and spinaches so now now they have a practical real world application of kind of what we're talking about it's not you know giant solar panels and wind turbines and everything else okay it's a it's a more local scale but it's the concept it's that train of thought that you know this is how you can erode that dependence on money because we're going to set this up in a way that now you're kind of more self-sufficient and as you erode that dependency on the system and give them more independence internally that is a helper so it's it's all the above and trying to institute real world solutions in their own backyard that they might be able to benefit from to help relieve those stressors and free them up to do uh, to expand themselves as well yes Excuse me. They speak perfect English. I know there's people here from TJ from Mexico visiting. I met them earlier. Alejandro, somewhere. There are three Alejandros, so they speak English. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, from your talks and presentations, technology is the savior of humanity? Question mark? <laughs> no, the applicable use of technology is the savior of humanity. There's a big difference between technology and how you use it. Here's a hammer. I'm gonna build a house for someone who needs a shelter or I'm gonna whack you upside the head. <laughs> is it the hammer's fault how it's being used? No. So it's about the intelligent application of our technologies. And some technologies aren't very good. Some technologies don't necessarily serve a proper purpose and they might not even be relevant as we move forward. What's the, what's the technological benefit of creating some crazy ass Franken food that is gonna give you cancer later on just because some scientists were paid to do so in a lab? I mean, that, what's the scientific relevance of that? And this is coming from a science geek. So some stuff doesn't apply and some stuff does. So what matters is how we use the technologies in a way that they're almost invisible to us, in a way that, yeah, okay, we've got wind turbines and stuff, but they're like integrated into the structure or whatever, and I don't even really notice them anymore. So we can adapt to those environmental adjustments. We do it all the time. Um, 
a, a tiny point to add to that is that whoever asked that question, you're already alive because of technology. So yes, actually, it is the savior of humanity in the sense that your life has already been prolonged, your teeth are not falling out and crumbling like they were after World War One and Two, and uh, you uh, even if you were to uh, suffer some serious, uh, used to be fatal uh, disease or problem, a lot of that has already been fixed as well, and it's always been through the exactly yeah all all of the kind of the the, the preventive measures that even we now in this lo-fi system have managed to do, plus the transportation you used to get here, plus the lights that are sh making my forehead shine like the uh, rear end of a lobster. So um, you owe a lot to technology. It's worth admitting to it. But yes, it's always going to be tied with the values too, like Douglas says. So that question was, technology is the savior of humanity, question mark. So um, the savior of, of humanity is living sustainably within the closed system that contains our life need. So technology is an extensionality of human ingenuity. And that goes back to your value system and how you apply it. People who, if a society that lives on an island that survives is living inside of a resource-based economy absent the advanced technology as a benefit for increasing their carrying capacity. I hope that makes sense. I've been absorbing this material for a long time, so I speak in jargon. But uh, uh, so in principle, you're living within equilibrium. I used that word earlier today with your environment. And being uh, respecting dynamic equilibrium is what will perpetuate your longevity inside of a finite system. Yeah, and I just want to add that technology in today's cultures, I don't know, if you look at it, it can be very isolating. It's obviously destructive with war. Uh, and it, it gets people moving in kind of an opposite direction where people want to return back to nature. I, I love going, you know, on nature walks and things like that. But people really want to, you know, they propose this as like a, a future direction. But I'll point out that technology, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not the savior of, of humanity. Of course it's not. There's this social it's all us we're the ones who apply all this stuff it, there's no one here on this earth but really us obviously there's animals and plant life but i think you guys know what i mean as far as technology everything is technical as far as we've pointed that out many times in our content and you know tech technology is really just a matter of something being functional or having you know a utility to it everything from shoelaces to a door lock to lock the bathroom when you go to the bathroom um Anything you know in the human body is functional. Uh, basically, everything in the known universe has some kind of functionality. So, in that sense, you, you, it's kind of abstract, but everything kind of is has a technical function to it. Is a completely technical tool, even though we don't think of it as such. Any, any process of thought is, is technical. Next. Next question. Yeah. Next question. How do we convince the upper class to agree to such a change as most of them like the fact and attention from owning things that most of the other people in the world cannot? Education, you say, is the key. But if that doesn't reach out to them, what's the alternative? Okay, I'll take this one because I, I used to be on this side and then, right, I... I was introduced to an environment where I actually met billionaires, not millionaires. And I spoke to them and I had you know, lunch with them and I went to their houses and look at their family and have a conversation, right? And, and these guys, they're just like us, okay? They are products of a system where they play their cards really well and it's not like they actively wanted to um, create suffering or misery. Most of them actually created a lot of wealth for a lot of people. Now, the thing is, even the most powerful person on the planet cannot change the whole fucking system, okay? That's a truth, that's a reality, okay? Um, now, you know I'm a proponent, a very fearful proponent of open source, so Bill Gates is not exactly my role model. However, this guy, um, pledged 99%, 99% of his wealth to socially responsible causes. Then you might say he's not spending it in the best way and you know whatever. Point is, he is single-handedly responsible for ending polio in India, 1.2 billion people, okay? 
he spent seven billion dollars just donating in vaccines to end polio and 800,000 people were saved. Now I'm not saying he's a hero, I'm saying there is no such distinction as us and them. So it's not convincing them, it's finding ways of better communicating among each other to understand each other better so that we can come to common ground and common solutions because we're all on the same side, really, because I know these guys and most of them are on everybody's side, they're not on their side. So I can speak for experience. And I'm sure there is gonna be the asshole who, you know, who just wants to hoard everything. You can point them out and say, those are the assholes. But they're victims of culture too, right? Of their culture. And uh, so I just think uh, better communication and better understanding and better and more empathy, okay? and stop with this mentality of us and them and let's have a war and it's, that's not gonna work. The question I sometimes wanna fire back to that too is what is it that you're thinking that they're losing when you're meeting the needs of the human population? What is it that you think that the wealthy are going to lose when people's uh, time with their families increase or when that, you know, they don't have to, to work as many hours per week or when the stress level goes down? It's like, where, where is the loss for people that can afford to purchase? Their purchasing power is greater. That's really what the difference is. is that di dif do you have a difference in purchasing power? Um, there's no loss, uh, you know, from, from what I see. For anyone that is wealthy, um, wealthy, got that. You got me going on that today. And um, uh, when you're actually meeting people's needs, so it, I don't. It's an, to me, it's an assumption that they're just not going to want it because the system's about taking away their stuff. And it's like it's not about taking away their stuff. It's about you're starting with need first, and then the stuff comes along with that. But um, so I don't. I don't. To me, it's an assumption to think that they're the ones. We're just taking it from them, and then some redistribution and blah blah blah. Um, I just wanted to say that we push in our society extrinsic values of money, fame, and status. And studies have shown that people that are focused on extrinsic values are less happy than those that are focused on intrinsic values of community service, close relationships, and um, the third one was uh, personal growth. Those three were the ones that made you feel better about yourself and happy. People say, well, how can you measure happiness? But for years we've been measuring depression and prescribing for it. There's a great documentary I watched called Happy and I highly recommend it. And it goes through the world and shows even countries that are happy and not. And the happiest countries aren't the ones that uh, are, you would think. They're the ones that the people are taking care of. Yeah, exactly. Well, Den Denmark's actually rated the, the happiest. Interestingly enough, Japan is rated the least happy because after World War II, when they were decimated and they rebuilt, they re rebuilt on the principles of just economic growth and GDP. And so now they have a disease there called Kiyoshi where young men are working themselves to death. That's how bad it is. So there is a connection between, like uh, Jen brought up, with the people that are really wealthy and feeling disconnected. They don't know if people like them for the right reasons. So I'm not, we're not demonizing that money or anything, but there is a psychology that comes with it. One last term I learned recently that I love is called hedonic treadmill. And that means that the more material wealth and goods you have, the more you want. So you're ne never satisfied. It just keeps increasing. So a lot of times people, you know, when you don't have money in our society, your, your, your motivation is, well, if I can just make the money, I'll keep going. But once you finally make it, and then you don't feel all that happiness, then what's next? So there is a connection between happiness and community. And sometimes I think those that are just focused on wealth don't have that, and joy is connection. So anyway. Uh, just to add something to what uh, Jason said and, and Fed said, uh, Possibly one way to communicate this would be to point out the reality that uh, middle class people today and even lower class to an extent live way better than people a couple hundred years ago or even a hundred years ago. So there's nothing, there's no reason to assume that uh, people at the top of the, the pyramid today have to have a lowered standard of living. Quite the contrary, everyone would be raised to the highest potential that uh, the planet can, can afford.
Uh, the whole phenomenon is a social phenomenon. So if people stop respecting those that have extreme high levels of wealth and their status, and hence the enabling of their control, then they will lose the support for feeling as validated as they do. So it's a cultural phenomenon, and it's invariably social and empathic, one direction or the other. So the wealthy, I think, actually feel very alienated. There's another documentary called The 1%, which expresses how alienated these people feel. And even, and Jen talked about this. Uh, it's how would you feel if you had a hundred billion dollars and were so detached from the rest of the world where you had to game plan everyone you interacted with? Because you know the vast majority are trying to get at you one way or another to get money from you or to have a relationship with you. So it's social. So you shift the social value system, stop praising the wealth and those that have it, and they'll come around, I think, very quickly. Like Jen said in her presentation, TZM is like a civil right movement. Then my question is, civil right movement at some point in time was met with great and vicious opposition by the system. Do you think TZM eventually will experience something similar once TZM becomes big enough to be a threat and is noticed by the government? It's too hard to predict. Uh, any type of social change is met with resistance one way or another, especially by a power establishment. The thing that I try to Im incorporate and I think has been touched upon uh, is to create an, a, a faceless, anonymous, yet organized type of environment. Uh, I do my best to restrict my visibility, believe it or not, and to reduce any type of figurehead status towards the movement. This is really important because the beauty of Occupy when it hit is no one, know who to, no one knew who to attack. Remember? They, even the, even the, this one PR company was finding certain people, and this was published, by the way, and they were going to make a huge PR campaign against these leaders that they deemed. It was leaked to the public. So the remaining as anonymous as possible, but yet being structurally organized and holographic in a chapter structure, where it's literally this system of everyone thinking the same way, really beginning the value transition in effect, it would ward off any type of attack like that, so to speak, because they wouldn't know they, meaning the power establishment or anyone who thinks in the form of power, wouldn't know where to go to stop it because it's that viral. And I would say, uh, given our 21st century context, the, the civil rights movement quite literally had to come together on a street corner and do a walk and something like that. We don't really have to. We have the internet, we have so many different variable ways to communicate and get information out that you don't even necessarily have to physically be in any particular place to get anything done. Yeah, yeah, we could walk a million of us, that'd be hilarious. But, um, you know, so, but it's not a requirement. So now there's no place to attack or to, to pull something like that off. And, and there are a shitload of us. And so, uh, and it's global. And it's everywhere. And good luck stopping this avalanche. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to add, um, it's, it's, you can't kill an idea, so the idea is going gonna, is gonna to go on. I mean, we've unleashed it. And we're already too big that you couldn't get all of us right now. So <laughs> um, I'm not saying there wouldn't be minor instances of, you know, as, as change, as we start to affect change in a way that is just so socially evident, it can't be ignored, that there wouldn't be some people upset about that and reactive. But I'm, I'm not worried about uh, the movement itself or the ideas itself getting squashed at this point. I mean, this is, yeah, as Doug said, it's an avalanche. One small story. Um, I was relating some of these ideas that I talk about and that we all talk about um, to a friend of mine who's not interested in the movement and isn't uh, part of it. He's quite religious, actually. And, but he understands the, the, the train of thought. And uh, when I pointed out that we had violent detractors, <laughs> uh, he said, you mean you have people who don't like what you're talking about? And I said, yeah. And he went, well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> So these are, the, these are the sort of the sympathizers that you, you would say are not in the movement, which we've all explained is not actu an actual thing anyway. Uh, so I would expect some resistance from the population, uh, very much like we saw with like Martin Luther King and all the rest of it. Um, so this sort of general support by humans, even if they don't necessarily directly call themselves or identify with the movement. Yeah? So I think, I think that's there too. And probably more than we think as well. Yeah. Yeah. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes.
Whoa, next. Okay. Rapid fire round, Jeopardy, go. Okay, go. To Peter Joseph, huh? regarding the Global Redesign Institute, could you elaborate on your most updated view or main goal for this project? The Global Redesign Institute is a macro industrial concept where through a graphic style Wikipedia open source interface, so to speak, even though it's not going to be as open as Wikipedia in the sense that anyone who just go in and do random things, Wikipedia is horrible like that, even though it does very well in certain instances, I wouldn't want Wikipedia users to design a new economy. <laughs> because <laughs> you'd only have the, the people that uh, literally sit behind their computer all day forcing their will upon the world uh, and making truth out of nothing. Uh, that's a whole other subject, though. If anyone wants to know the background of that, just look at the Zeitgeist Movement's Wikipedia article, and you see that Wikipedia is not always that great. But never, nevertheless, uh, in a system that's actually using science as a physical reference for decision-making processes and through what will eventually be algorithmic computation of core true economic variables like what Jason talked about before. So what happens in this, people come in, ideally with some type of background in engineering, or at least critical thought and creative thinking. And ideally, this would work through chapters. So people in Los Angeles would be able to go to this website, big, good interface, highly interactive, many variables, but yet simple enough to understand, and begin to think about how they would reconstruct from the square meter all the way out to the entire city of Los Angeles, using true economic variables such as how transport would work for maximum efficiency. And there's lots of techno jargon I could spit out with respect to what would actually be taken into account to compute the society. It's not that some guy goes, I want a pretty building here. It says, what's the use of this? How does it work with the population? What are the energy resources of the region? What kind of stuff can we put on the coastline to actually utilize, say, energy off of the, uh, excuse me, tidal or, or wave energy? All the variables that we've talked about and passing again back to Jason's lecture. This will give a position, a virtual uh, place, excuse me, where people can actually go and create these things. And the fact that it's a public forum, I think, is really exciting to me because it really engages the group mind. You know, we talk about how we can arrive at, a, at conclusions in this sort of computational way, uh, but there isn't an existing AI system that can do this yet. So we are the AI system. And yes, we can think critically and logically enough to pull this off if we get rid of the bias of the market economy, because this entire idea is to say, let's do what's technically relevant and what will work to the highest optimized efficiency we know how, and forget the idea of what it's going to cost. And that's really the most profound point of it all, because every time you talk to people about this stuff, even the technical stuff, like the stuff that Doug's working with, you know, trying to get his farm system stuff up, he's got to deal with money. And everyone says, well, how much is it going to cost? And as though that's a real variable in a society that's actually trying to be sustainable away from the monetary system. So I hope that answers your question. It's a work in progress. Very little has been done other than the structure of it, but the reasoning is there. And the next round is to get a very concentrated group of extremely good programmers and engineering-oriented thinkers to digest these variables, because it's not going to be complete, but it's going to show an example. And to make a final note, just like we have Zeitgeist Day, there will be conferences that exist all around the world for the Global Redesign Institute to show people, ideally in 3D modeling, what their region would look like without they, them having to pay for energy because it's so efficient, without them having to pay for food because it's so efficient, and without having them to pay for general goods as a step-by-step -step layered process. Again, that was kind of talked about in the transition that Eva did. So I hope that makes sense. I could rattle on and on, but that's basically it, and it's got a long ways to go before it's implemented in its virtual website form. For Peter or Federico, how do you see the coming singularity, as Ray Kurzweil would say, affecting the current social, economic, and political climate as we move closer towards it? Okay. Well, so um, I don't know the answer what happens after a singularity. I think anybody who gives you an answer is either lying or is mentally ill. <laughs> so I think we are already uh, experiencing dramatic change as we move towards a hypothetical or possible singularity. By the way, singularity is the time when computers become smarter in any respect uh, than humans. So, you know, they can improve themselves exponentially. So, you know, in when Werner Vinci, who coined the term singularity, was asked, will machines ever be as smart as humans? He said, yes, for a very brief moment. <laughs> right, so um, I think we are already in this massive social change driven by technology. And um, 
the social economic the social economic system is is a chaotic system. It's unpredictable, and nobody really knows where where it's going. What we do know is that we see a trend towards openness, towards sharing, towards collaboration. Because I think it's inevitable. It started with the Enlightenment way before that, thousands of years ago. Somebody was talking about the same things. And now technology is enabling this, this will to kindle, to actually have this, this spark to, to, be, to become something bigger and to engulf the whole planet. And this is because of instantaneous communication and the power of ideas and cultural memes becoming the replacement of genes in our culture. So we are in the middle of it and we should be supporting these open source projects. We should be fighting legislation that promotes meaningless and useless and unproductive and very harmful patent laws and copyright laws and Disney and all that bullshit. We should fight it with all of our strength and um, support the Electronic Frontier Foundation, okay? These guys, they do some amazing work and they protect our rights online and they, are, they don't get any money, okay? All of these guys, they work pro bono. They are some of the smartest uh, technicians, computer programmers and lawyers on the planet working pro bono to, to um, fight for our rights online. And uh, all the money they get, they just use it because of the expenses, the huge expenses that some of the, some of the you know, we could be, um, uh, we, we, could, we could be getting a, what's it called, a, a lawsuit from somebody tomorrow, and we don't have the means. So the only, the only way we could fight it would be to ask the Electronic Frontier Foundation, can you help us, right? And people like those. Uh, so support great products, projects, open source projects that you think like the Khan Academy, like uh, open source ecology. There are tons of them. Find them out. Support them. Um, support them with your time. Support them with your money. Support them with your ideas. Support them in any way you can. And move forward in a much faster and better way. Okay, last question. What are we going to do as far as the animals used in farming? Are we going to promote a model of veganism or just more compassion and consideration for all living beings? This is a very common question and there's uh, multiple answers to it. Um, the, the violence you see at the moment with uh, slaughterhouses being the way they are, that violence comes from saving money. Uh, it's not to do with people going, yeah, I really want to torture a cow and all the people eating it going, yeah, I hope this cow fucking died really horribly because it's more delicious when, it, it, when it's died in fear, right? So obviously the, one of the first steps is that with the amelioration of um, those kinds of uh, intensive and, and, and they're violent for the planet too, for the actual soil systems too, that kind of farming, you actually reduce a lot of the violence through, uh, if you like, cultivating food, including animals, correctly. Um, now, a lot of people keep saying, oh, it'll be great when we can print steaks in the future. Now, I find this to be the most hilarious future guess ever. Why would you print something that you're only eating because you get it out of a cow now? You can create all kinds of new foods, can't you, that don't have to have the veiny texture of meat that you've got used to through being a hunter-gatherer. So, uh, <laughs> you can see that there's all kinds of future biases at work here. Um, whether it's veganism or not, that's always going to be a personal choice, I think. Um, I think that, the, the, like I say, the slow amelioration of, of pain and suffering of animals, the, the general increase of plant-based diets are, is a good idea. Uh, there's, there's, there's various health uh, things about red meat, about dairy that are true. I've been off dairy now for about two months just to see what it's like. It's been 32 years. I wonder what it's like without milk in my face every day, right? Um, the, these are... <laughs> these are... These, this, there's no right or wrong answer to this, but there, there is going to be the sort of general amelioration by doing it in a much more humane way. Humane because it's more efficient rather than financially efficient. And I think that's going to hopefully take care of a lot of it. Plus, the increased and um, uh, supportive structures for people who are vegans would actually enable people to be vegans very easily. And it's actually quite tricky to, to, to choose large-scale uh, dietary uh, avoidances at the moment. So it's only going to become easier for those that want to, and I think it'll get generally better for everyone in that sense. Sure, yeah. A, a lot of these questions are put forward as though we're or some body is imposing a type of value, like you will ha have to be a vegan or you're not allowed to have pets or something like this. All, what, what will 
probably be the reality is that information will be provided uh, with, w without the monetary system poisoning the scientific landscape and and making it really difficult to decipher what you know what actually is the truth because of conflicting uh, industry uh, you know there'd be a common goal towards figuring out what actually is the the truth towards this because you have a common goal rather than uh, a competitive system dominating everything so it, it's not there's no type of imposition of values it's it's access to information and the hope is that people uh, will essentially be educated enough to move towards the, the correct uh, choice for society do you want to conclude it? Do you want to conclude it? My goodness. Yeah. What an honor. Let me do this like Louis C.K. then and stand up. <laughs> I'm just a show-off bastard. Um, look, I'd like to thank all of you. Um, it's uh, Every time I do one of these things, and every time I think I would speak for everyone when we do this, we probably look back on our lives and go, wow, this is weird. Uh, I, I would have never thought I'd have done anything like this in my life. And uh, it's always wonderful to be supported and to see uh, new speakers come out, uh, to see new information done, new projects created. It is worthwhile. Um, I think watching uh, P uh, Federico's video especially, at the end of that I was like, you know, it's kind of awesome to be human. That's kind of great. Um, and it's, it's worth saving, it's worth improving, it's worth improving everything that surrounds the human beings as well. Uh, it's not a bad time, it's not a bad way to spend your free time, I would submit. Uh, and it's always worth it because of you. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Please, we're outside as well to talk further. This doesn't have to end when the doors close and we all run away and then plot to take people's stuff. Take people's stuff. <laughs> so once again, thank you very much and we'll see you outside. Thank you.